What's up, guys? Welcome to Arisar's Life. My name is Chris. Thank you so much for joining me. In today's episode, I'm going to go over three huge mistakes that a lot of resellers are making. And I actually think that eBay is making the same mistakes right now as ICE, that company that I think runs the NASDAQ, made an offer to purchase them. And I don't know if eBay is ripe to be purchased, but I do think it's undervalued. So maybe it's a good idea for someone to come in and take advantage of the, the same mistakes that I see a lot of resellers making. I just want to make sure in the chat that you guys can hear me before I get into this live stream. I haven't done a, a live stream in a while, so I'm excited to talk to people live and see what their thoughts are on these three huge mistakes as well. Let me just see if this is working before we continue. Let's see. I think it's working, but I just want to make sure. If you guys are just stopping here for the first time, um, I resell for a living full time. And if you guys want to, the same that I see a lot let's of see if it's working, somebody comment in the chat and then I'll just continue working. All right. Free thinker. Thanks for stopping by. Let's get straight into it. Okay. So the number one mistake that I see that resellers do is they do not manicure their yard that's how i what i'm calling it meaning once you get an item listed you don't do anything else to it over time and then it starts to slowly die and not work and what i mean by that is you don't have a strategy to make sure that item sells so these are the things i recommend that you guys do you need an aged inventory process so what happens when items get stale what are you doing to get rid of those items make them sell faster? What are you doing to make these items move so you can get that capital back in your inventory and turn it over? If you turn your, your money over 20% every single month, meaning you turn a, a dollar into a dollar 20 over and over again every single month, you, I think the math is like over the course of two years, you turn a grand into 720 grand. Okay, that's it's ridiculous. If you can actually just keep making a 20% return on your money, the thing is it gets harder over time to spend that much money. But the number one mistake is not manicuring your store. So you don't have a process like, are you running promotions? Are you cross-listing? What are you doing to make your items sell faster? Do you even know who you're competing against? Who's your target market on that item? It's hard the more items you have. So you'll see a lot of stores do really well when they're small and then when they start to grow the weeds start growing they don't take care of their store they don't have any promotions they don't cross list they don't do any discounts they don't do any promoted listings they don't do auctions they don't re-donate and uh, over time what happens is you get an entire store of stale listings i think ebay has also done this ebay makes a fortune off of the now good till canceled fees for items that never will sell People have items listed for two, three, four, five years. They're paying 10 cents a month. They have no idea. And those listings have already been suppressed, meaning they're not showing up in search results anymore because why would eBay waste that traffic? And so you're just paying eBay a fee every single month. But I think overall, that's one of the reasons why eBay is declining. They shouldn't do that. They should focus on the customer experience. And not being able to find an item is a poor experience for a customer. So I think that they should do their best to clean those listings out. Don't just make a fee on them. Create incentives or create programs to get people to fix their aged inventory so it can actually move. And they need to focus on maybe making it a an excellent place to buy stuff. Support the, the customers instead of just trying to make a buck on the end of the listing. I think that's an issue. So you guys are being charged for listings now, whether they sell or not. You need to be very in tune and have an aged process. Um, this is part of my 10 step program um, that if you do those 10 things every single day, um, it will fix your store. Um, I have that for free either in the community section or on my Instagram. Um, you can also purchase a copy in the link below for 12 bucks, but you could just do it for free as well. And one of those is constantly improving your listings. If you improve 4% of your listings a day over the course of a month, you crush all of it. Okay. Number two. This is the most important thing that you can do. So please smash the like button and then listen carefully. And that is avoiding bad buys. 
Okay, this is really, really, really important. I'm really proud of a lot of items I have said no to. You, you, can only, you only have so much time and you only have so much capacity. So I see a lot of resellers find an item that's profitable and they buy it, but it's not profitable enough and it's not replenishable. It's a one-time deal. It's gonna take a lot of research, a lot of cleaning, a lot of testing. And before you know it, you've wasted one or two, three hours on one item and it might be a slow seller. So you're sort of buying something that's just wasting your time instead of just waiting for a better item or a better opportunity, avoid bad buys at all costs. And this comes from understanding how many customers you wanna serve. Please write this down. If you are trying to serve, like I hear this all the time, oh, it's just bread and butter, it'll sell quick in my store. The thing is, that's, that sounds good at first, but it's preventing you from building a store of really high quality items because you don't know who your customer is. You're just buying something because it's cheap and I just see your whole store being clogged up with stuff that is was a good deal, but there's no real market for it. And it's better to just pick who you want to serve. Maybe you want to sell sewing equipment or you want to sell crafts. Knowing what those people buy and finding those items is faster than looking for cheap crafting items and throwing them up. It's, it's counterintuitive. You'd, you'd make more money figuring out what people want to buy and then finding that instead of just listing random stuff you find. So avoid um, bad buys. This is something I think eBay really needs to focus on. They need to really push, this is what's trending right now, go buy this, so that you can make money on eBay. They're, they're, they're not doing that enough in my opinion. So maybe some, somebody who stops by and purchases eBay or if they get new management, they can just focus on helping us source because here's the thing that's really difficult with eBay. It's velocity. Velocity is really difficult. Okay, you don't really know how long an item is gonna take to sell unless it's brand new. If it's pre-owned, is a little bit of art, right? So how many items um, have sold in the last 90 days? You can kind of gauge how many views and likes and watchers. I have one item with 68 watchers on it. Um, I don't, I probably don't need to discount that item or it's a bunch of people trying to price their items. It, you know, it, you, you don't really know, you're kind of guessing. And if, if eBay was more transparent and saying like, this is eBay rank number 10,000, they have this actually in, in Terapeak, but it's not as obvious when you're sourcing. I think they need to train their people to just pick better items, okay? Because that's gonna, that's gonna save you a ton of time just listing stuff that people already want to buy, then you don't need to be fancy. You don't need incredible long descriptions and title. You just are listing things that people want. And if you're listing things that people want, it doesn't matter what platform you are on. They will find it and then buy it from you. Okay, so number three, this is the most important one. So thank you for, for stopping by and I appreciate the people who have subscribed to my channel. We just hit the 50,000 subscriber mark, so which is awesome. Um, this is the mass, this is the most important thing. Do not improve random things. Okay. Do not master the irrelevant. There are so many people who are like, I finally have my Facebook strategy for sharing when that has like almost 0% effect on your store. So you've mastered something that you could have just got rid of. You spent the whole week perfecting a background that's unique to your store, which has nothing to do with the customer experience. They don't need a unique background. They just need the item to be clearly depicted. There are tons of examples of stores where the pictures are horrible and they make tons of money because they're listing the correct items. So this is the how you can solve this. Okay, ask yourself these questions. What is an ideal item for you? What is an ideal item for you? What does that mean? Is it $20 profit? Is it easy to list? Is it small? Is it replenishable? Is it only from a distributor? Is it, does it require zero prep? Meaning you buy it and it's ready to list as soon as you get it. Is it something you've already listed before and you don't even need to make a listing? What is your perfect listing look like? You need to write that down first. This will help you master not doing things that don't matter. So what is it that you even want to list? Figure that out. Then ask yourself this question. This is really, really, really important. How many of those perfect items did you list today? 
That's it. That's the main question, right? Don't if if you your goal is twenty dollars profit, why did you list that five dollar profit hat? That's that's not related to your twenty dollar profit. You could have donated that hat and used the same time while you were at the store to find a twenty dollar item. You just made fifteen dollars more with the same amount of work. And just because you understand, I am looking for twenty dollar profit items, or you could be more aggressive. Only look for hundred dollar profit items. My wife only likes selling things that are a hundred dollars profit or more because she doesn't have that much time. She's like, what would people spend three to five hundred dollars on? In her category, it's wedding shoes. She likes wedding shoes. She likes reading about them. She likes buying them. She likes sourcing them online. She can do that at work when work is slow. So she doesn't buy things to flip that aren't a hundred dollars profit because she only has. Two hours of shopping a week to find one pair that she flips with me, and that's like her extra money, right? And it's it's very it's actually really、um, convenient for her because she can give it to me and I will sell it, and then if she uses that money to buy something, she'll just add it to the eBay cart, and then I'll pick it up. <laughs> very streamlined.、Um, but as far as understanding what it is that you need to sell, how many of those did you list today? Then this is the. the I keep saying this is the most important question, but this is actually the most important question. The most important question is, what's the one thing you can do to increase that one listing to two? What could you do? Is it meeting a supplier? Is it getting in your car and going to three more stores? Is it garage sales? Is it estate sales? What is it? And、um, For me, I've started to recognize because I've really been studying、uh, McDonald's and how they were able to scale to the point where I was reading online that in four hours, a person with、um, a high school degree can learn most of what they do at McDonald's. That's amazing, right? So you're taking a 16 to 18 year old person with no experience working at your company, and in four hours, they can pretty much do it. That's amazing. Right, I, I don't, and because of that, I do not want to rely on talented people to help me. I don't. I want my system to be very clean, straightforward, easy to manage. And right now, I'm having great success with a few sourcing scouts for me. I had them figure out how much money they are making per hour, and today they worked it out to between twenty-one and twenty-seven dollars an hour. That is an that's excellent pay、um, for somebody helping me on the side. And that's more than they're going to be making running a small resale store. If you have a obviously, if you are seasoned and you have a a, a store that's a certain size and you have some systems, you're going to make more than twenty one to twenty seven dollars an hour. But for a high school or college student, that's great income. Okay, so right now I'm laying it out. What does this job look like? And my objective is for this person to be able to find one hundred items that meet my criteria. And this is really interesting to me. So, what is my ideal item? And I and I just realized it's an item that requires zero prep. So I don't want to clean it or steam it or measure it. I don't want to do any of that. It needs to be list ready. Photo as soon as it it arrives or somebody works for me, photographing listing. No prep work, right? For me, that's ideal.、Um, also. I want the soles to be easily verifiable, and I want it to sell for minimum twenty percent margin per month. So if I'm gonna wait five months, that's five months times twenty percent margin. I want to double my money, which is a hundred percent. If I'm gonna wait five months, if I'm only gonna wait one month, then let's just sell it right now and get my twenty percent. So that's helping make make it easier for me to decide if I'm if I want to do twenty percent now. Let's let's grab it. If it's gonna sell quick, and I don't have to do anything, let's go for it. Now, here's the thing: I'm finding it easier and easier to say no to things that take work. If if it's a lot of broken stuff, no for me. Even though that's probably the highest profit margin, I have to fix it. I have to test it. I have to do the conditioning. I have to do the describing. I have to figure out what's wrong with it, and I have to risk a higher rate of return. Pass. And I have to maybe rely on somebody else's discretion. I don't want that. I want it to be very straightforward. So for me, a perfect item is an item that doesn't require any prep, earns at least twenty percent, verifiable sold. Somebody else can easily find it. 
I don't want unicorn items that they need to go search 16 stores to find three of them. I don't want that. I want something easy that they can go to any store and find it. And this is, this is really hard for me to say, um, but I actually do think I want the item to be sub $20, um, not including shipping. I think between $15 and $20 plus shipping is actually what I want because that kind of stuff sells really fast. And as long as it has sold, if some of them have sold for $30 to $40, then $15 to $20 should be no problem. Right, so I'm looking for this fast turn stuff in the lower range, and it's easier to find. Okay, so this is my analogy. And if you guys are here, please help me out, smash the like button, so other people can help find this channel. Uh, what's up, Kevin from the Thrifting Lounge? We're gonna do some videos soon. I just haven't really had time to think about um, collaborations recently, but I will get more into that. Here's my analogy. Okay, the biggest companies right now in resale. Um, I think you guys sh should probably take note are Ross and like Dollar Tree, Dollar General. These are the companies that are crushing. Okay, they're really killing the market. If you look at the difference between Ross and Marshalls, Ross makes way more money. But have you guys ever been to a Ross? It's like a, a straight garbage, right? The, the buyer, the person that buys the products for Ross is like literally whatever what goes into like as, as long as it has a barcode let's throw it in our store as long as it's cheap enough and if you walk through a ross i mean unless you you guys have different kind of rosses than me it's probably like 10 items that are 50 to 100 dollars, and then 99.9 percent .9 of the items are under 20 dollars, broken ugly clearly clearance and some kind of a knockoff poor quality but it's like so cheap that people just walk in there and you know spend five to twenty dollars quick and um th this is the point the point is ross is not relying on a super talented buyer any buyer will work when your price point is that low so duncan is saying that people are most more likely to um um, buy a good item 15 to 20 dollars and you're getting less returns. I, I, I agree with that. It depends on like a pre-owned item in the 15 to 20 dollar range. I feel like people are not really returning. If it's brand new, I return 15 to 20 dollar stuff that's not perfect. I'm expecting it to do exactly what it says. And sometimes it does exactly what it says and I'm, I'm still returning it. Somebody said, I don't know if this is true. Somebody said that Amazon's returns are 11% across the whole platform. Is that true? Is it that high? On the whole platform, because that's crazy. Um, that means that that's that's literally millions of packages a day that um, get returned. If that if the return rate is really that high, I don't know. I'm not. I'm I'm happy taking a break from Amazon selling right now. Um, and again, my idea is I want scouts to bring me inventory, and I'm loving it so far. And I'm wanting it to be easy to find. I don't want. $60 ASP is reserved for my own personal finding stuff. $20 ASP plus shipping for a scout, I would consider excellent. Especially if I did the math on it. I really want to be in the item about 3 to $5. Okay, and that includes their finder's fee. Um, and I'll go up to $5 if they list it for me. So this has been my test so far and experimenting. So I appreciate you guys following me on my journey and listening to my thoughts, thinking out loud. Um, if you guys are just joining, the three things that I don't want people to do is don't forget to take care of your store. You need an aged inventory process. I call it manicuring your yard. What's your aged inventory process? Are you doing promotions, cross-listing? Are you delist, relisting? Are you doing price reductions? Are you increasing your promoter listings rate, auctions, donations? What are you doing to get rid of your stuff? Number two, avoid bad buys. This is impossible if you don't know what a bad buy is. Okay, so you need to define for yourself what is it that you even want to sell? Who do you want to sell it to? And that makes it easier. Um, then you need to ask yourself the questions. How long do you want to get your capital back? What's your average cost of goods sold? What kind of return do you want on it? Then the last one, number three, is stop improving random things. This is why I'm super happy not being on Instagram or Facebook because you see things that you want to go improve that don't matter, right? The thing that matters is 
how many ideal items did you list today? And then what can you do to list more of those things? That's really the main thing. The main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. That's from Ben Horowitz, I think. That makes sense to me. It's not to be really good at things that don't matter. I see people talking about, look at my, I mean, I'm not going to, I'm going to call out this person, but lovingly. Somebody put, daily refinement told me to improve my pictures. And there's picture A and picture B. And picture B is like almost the same quality. Picture A was already good. So like, I hope she didn't spend too much time making it into picture B. I like the, the, the slow and steady improvement, but that's not going to necessarily result in quicker sales, right? Um, so I like that, but that might not be the main thing. Usually the main thing is not improving your already good photos. Now, if you have horrible photos, maybe the main thing is to take better photos, but her initial picture was okay. So Connor is asking about what is a good sell-through rate? Depend this is a great question. It depends on your category. Okay, so if you have... Um, if you, ha if you sell electronics, let's say for example, pro audio equipment. Um, I like to sell pro audio equipment within seven days. It's really hot, sells like crazy. Podcasts, YouTube channels are exploding. Uh, if I was gonna try to enter and make something, I'd try to make a microphone because people need good quality audio. I don't know if this sounds good, um, but this is an expensive microphone. Hopefully it sounds good, right? But again, this is like something that should sell immediately. Now, if you're selling, um, old Navy sunglasses, that's not very strong because Old Navy sunglasses are $5 in the store. Now, so there are certain like Old Navy jeans that might sell for $20 that you can find thrifting for a buck because it's a very, very, it's like the bottom of the rung brand in the US. Maybe that is a good flip for Old Navy, but again, it depends on the category. If you had a pair of, of Old Navy sunglasses listed for $5 free shipping, you still might not sell it. Even if it was four dollars free shipping, even if it was two dollars free shipping, you might not sell it ever because it's it's you know brand new at the store. They can go there and actually just pick it up. What's up, Ivan? Um, yeah, Australia. Um, I can't believe there are more people who live in California than Australia. I feel so spoiled. Um, but um, so Jack in the chat is saying that his Amazon return rate is two percent overall. And then clothing and, and shoes will be much higher. I, I, I want to look up that article that somebody put that 11% overall. That is crazy. That means like everyone should just learn how to sell out Amazon returns because um, that's insane. I, I have considered doing that. So there's been a few Amazon resellers who have reached out and said, will you sell my Amazon returns? And I don't know how to answer that um, because I, I don't know what products they sell. So let me know in the chat if that's something you guys would consider. Um, would you um, sell somebody else's Amazon returns? What's up, Liz? Liz says she returns 15% of stuff to Amazon. I totally agree with that. Like if, if it's not perfect, it's going straight back. The return process is so easy. So um, that, that's a great example on the phone cases. Um, it took me a while to find the perfect phone case. I love this phone case. It fits three cards and I only returned one that didn't match though, but I can see maybe returning three or four of them. Connor's asking, what is a good sell through rate for shoes on eBay? Great question. But again, it depends on what kind of shoes. Um, I have a pair, I have 10 pairs of champion shoes that are brand new, they're black, okay? And my supplier said, do you want these for $2 a piece? New in box, okay? And I said, let me look at solds. There are no solds. And of the solds that there are similar, they're selling for between 10 and $20 free shipping in a shoe category, which is really low because you're going to have some returns. So 12 to $20, including shipping in a high return category is usually a no, no to begin with. And they were all black and they're ugly and not ugly in a good way, ugly in, as in a poor design and all black, right? So I said, no, I don't want those shoes. And then he said, you can have them for free, right? So, okay, I have them listed in my store for $12 free shipping and I haven't sold any. So the, the sell to your rate is horrible. So it depends, right? But if you're listing, um, let's say Travis Scott, um, 
Jordans, right? It's really hot. They sell multiple times a day. You could list it $25 below stock X and, or if there's an eBay coupon and I would be surprised if you didn't sell that pair of shoes in one day, right? So it just depends on what you are selling. So that's a great question. Sell through rate is something everyone should pay attention to. It's actually Jack's guide that I am referencing on the sell through rate turning a thousand bucks into 700 grand over a couple of years if you can just keep flipping it. Um, this is why John, an Amazon seller that I know, he does, he spends $250,000 a week and makes between 10 and 20,000 per week. And people were, are like, I would never do that. I would never sell for those low margins. And I'm like, you would never make 40 to $80,000 per month profit. You don't want that. Like it's, you're above that. I mean, the sell to your rate is crazy. And then also he's selling in categories that are really expensive. So the average selling price is like $200. So that means you're spending like 150 to sell for 200. And there's not, believe it or not, there's not that much competition in that kind of category because it's, it's capital intensive, right? To play that game, he recommends at least 30 grand and an engineering background because he's like, it's just about making sure you understand the numbers and turning it over. So it, it is very interesting. Um, Brittany says she just started reselling. Awesome. Start with stuff around the house. Please don't spend a lot of money. Go to my Instagram, grab that list of things that you need to do for free. It's my most recent post and just do those 10 things and go to my Facebook group, the reseller collective and ask questions there for free to get started. Um, and then, yeah, please don't spend a whole bunch of money when you're just getting started because you need to learn sort of how it works. Um, let's see, Yvonne, what's going on? Um, Liz is saying you would totally buy Amazon returns. I know I have, oh, I don't know if there's an Amazon bins, but they do have liquidation here. There's one, maybe like two blocks from my storage unit. Um, I just don't know what's in them. But th that being said, they're all manifested. That's nice though. Usually they're manifested, which is unlike eBay liquidation or the Goodwill bins, right? Or Savers has bins in Las Vegas that I went to one time. Um, those are non-manifested because they're all pre-owned, right? And there's usually no box. So it is very interesting. Also, I want to ask you guys, um, I'm supposed to go on my honeymoon next week. Um, we pushed it, we pushed it to, um, we pushed the honeymoon to right now because of Q4. So I was busy and did not go on my honeymoon until now. But th uh, four days of our honeymoon, which is three weeks long, are in Hong Kong, right? And we're not supposed to go to Hong Kong right now because there's the coronavirus, right? So um, um, we're trying to maybe visit some family in Asia and they and they just told us yesterday, if you come, we won't hang out with you because what if we give it to you? We, we don't know. So if we were to go to Hong Kong, we wouldn't even see her family or like at all. So it's just like we would just be hanging out on our own. So right now, some of the airlines and hotels are offering partial refunds. So um, it's looking like we're just going to not go on our honeymoon, but then I don't know um, what we could replace it with. So, um, I don't know. That is an interesting, interesting, uh, proposition, but most likely we will not go. And I don't know what to do with those travel credits. I don't have any other plans. So don't know. Maybe you guys can reach out if you have any suggestions for where to go on vacation. Um, Just heard you on eBay podcast from eBay open 2018. Yeah, I think I've been on the eBay podcast twice now. Um, I, yeah, I enjoy it. eBay has a really a ridiculously nice eBay podcast studio. It's amazing. It's in San Jose. I haven't been going to a lot of events in um, San Jose recently, but um, I'm still very pro eBay. I love eBay. eBay is awesome. Um, and I do think that it's my favorite for it's like the um it's it's like they don't handle any of the products so i feel like they're just really profitable and they're going to be around forever um if somebody does end up buying them and changing the process so that it's a lot better um, i do think they have a bright future in a sense that the velocity help 
if they had a it gave it a, a good time to do um I mean, it's a good time to help create some velocity tools for eBay. I think that would really, really help out the platform. Um, also, somebody said, or yeah, the, the, as far as the podcast goes, I have a podcast now, and it's the same format as this YouTube video, these YouTube videos, and it's called The Reseller's Life. So I would appreciate you guys um, checking it out on iTunes. If you want to leave me a review on iTunes and then email me at chris at dailyrefinement.com, I'll send you the PDF for my 10-day challenge for free. Just email me and say you left a review and you want the challenge for free. I was giving away my course, but um, I was only going to give it to 10 people and I already gave those away. So um, go on the iTunes or Stitcher and leave a review, uh, positive or negative. If you don't like it, just be honest. And then uh, I'll send you a free PDF to check it out. But that's um, the podcast experience is awesome. It's totally different people than YouTube. So people, it's people who are listening at work or on their commute and they write emails and communicate with me, which is different than YouTube. So I'm enjoying the podcast that comes out three times a week. This week has been a little bit gnarly because of the trying to see if we wanted to reschedule our honeymoon or not. But it looks like um, Duncan is right. Not a good time to go to Asia, period. So I think we're going to stop. So Alfonso says, thoughts on the Poshmark shipping increase? Um, this is a great question. This is one of those things which is mastering the irrelevant, which is my number three. Uh, I, if I were you, I would not spend any time thinking about the Poshmark increase because everyone had the Poshmark shipping increase. I think it's seven, seven something now. Um, instead of wasting that time researching it, you could be finding better items that are sort of um, are going to sell anyway, even with that seven, that slight increase. I don't think they need a first class option. I feel like people on Poshmark are trigger happy. They buy what's trendy. They buy stuff that's cheap. Um, Poshmark is an excellent platform and they have the balance stored. So you can sell an item and then use that balance to buy other items and they're, they're just looking for what's trending. If that didn't work, if that wasn't true, then sharing wouldn't matter. Okay, and everyone knows sharing does matter because people are looking through the feed and just buying off of that impulsively, right? If, if it was like eBay, then it would just be who has the best item for the best price. That's not true though for Poshmark. If you look at the solds, you'll see that people who share more often sell more items, even items that, that don't make sense. And if you guys know my history with Poshmark, the original, when I started Poshmark, these two ladies on the East Coast said, Chris, we have 600 clothing items and we sell 400 per month. Will you help us scale? And I was like, I've never heard of uh, clothing sellers that sell that many. 600 and selling 400 is really high, right? So I went into their closets and the bot that they had was sharing those 600 items 10 times per day on a schedule. So not, not simple posture, not all these Chrome extensions, an actual, a proper bot, okay? Um, so they had one that was fully automated, meaning it would open up Poshmark and share all the items then turn off then come back and do it again later, right? Fully automation, not like the ones where you need to control it. And so that's 6,000 shares a day with 600 items. And their sell-through rate was ridiculous and their items were not that special, right? They were like, um, like maybe like uh, one level above Banana Republic, like, you know, a little bit nicer, not like all Eileen Fisher or something, but Eileen Fisher again on, on Poshmark, maybe not that hot, but I don't, I don't know my, my girl brands that well, but like whatever the girl brands that they were selling at was one level above Banana Republic, 20 to $30 items selling like crazy. Right. And that's what got me interested. So when I first started on Poshmark, I started day one with a bot. I didn't know that was, I, at the time, I did not even know that was like a, a no, no because um, I only heard about it from these two ladies that were killing it. So um, that matters. And again, that's why I don't care about the, the shipping increase. Because what really matters is, can you share your items consistently? Can you put items that people want to buy? The shipping increase doesn't matter because it's everyone gets the same shipping increase. I like it when people waste their time thinking about that because I'm like, awesome. Whoever's pumping out all this negativity, that's great for people who don't, don't care because we can just focus and make money today while they're not doing anything but complaining in the forums. We're listing and earning money. Um, people, somebody says Poshmark sales are dead. I, I don't, that's not the case with me. Um, but again, I think it's not safe 
to only sell on one platform. Okay, so you guys should figure out a way to cross list on multiple platforms. Let's see. So Kat is saying sharing matters because the search results are in the order of last year. I know, but the point is that if if Poshmark buyers didn't shop that way, then it wouldn't work. For me, I don't I don't shop from last shared. That doesn't make sense to me as a consumer. I type in what I'm looking for and then buy it. For some reason, the way Poshmark works is people will just scroll mindlessly and buy something, right? So as an example, if you look in my store, there are Merrill boots, right? I'm not really sharing my closet right now, but I share those Merrill boots 10 to 20 times a day. I sell one almost every single day. If you go to my closet right now, you'll see I sold 60 pairs of these Merrill boots over and over again because because people shop from the feed. If I stop doing that, these Merrill boots will never sell because there are so many Merrill boots for sale. But what's crazy is when I look through the listings, there are people who have the exact same boots for, for $10 less and their boots didn't sell. So my point is you have to understand the platform on eBay. That would never work because people, because it just shows you that the best, the best one, the best match. Um, Oh, William is asking about the app completely. Sorry, there's a bit of a delay on the questions. Um, I love completely. I love using the sold listings. I love Sellhound. I love the app Snap from Jonathan. You guys can check that out in the um, in the Chrome store. Very, very cool app. I don't know if there's a free trial or not, but all apps that teach you about the sell-through rate of, of things are fantastic. Terapeak, these are where you should spend the most of your time. William. That is one of the best questions of the chat so far. That is what you should be worrying about, testing different software that teaches you what's going to sell fast or not. And if you guys are still here, still smash that like button. Um, oh, this Jeremy is asking a great question. Jeremy just joined my Patreon call, which is in the morning, guys. If you can make it at 6 in the morning, uh, Monday through Friday, it's half an hour. So we just want to go over what you're working on today. And no one brings up stuff like the shipping increase because it doesn't matter. Um, how do I determine sell-through rate? This is the best question because um, everyone does do it differently. But for me, I'm basically looking for verifiable solds in the last 90 days. And ideally, I want the, the market to be the same. So I want 90 items listed and 90 items sold in the last 90 days. For me, that that's an ideal sell-through rate. And I even give it a little bit more more room than that. I'm okay with it taking five months to sell as long as I double my money. Um, yeah, see, Liz is saying that her numbers quadrupled after sharing, right? So that, that tells you something about the people who buy on Poshmark, right? They're not shopping what they want, size, best price. That's how I shop. I don't know how, but I think it's, it's more social, right? So people go on there and they'll, sh they'll buy something that's trending or in a party. Um, obviously that's how it works. Otherwise that would sharing would not matter. Um, flex Zeus is saying you're new to eBay selling and any tips to selling your items. You feel like a hoarder. Yes. Manicure your items. That's eBay mistake. Number one. You have to get rid of the items that you have listed. Do not become a hoarder. Discount them. Uh, actually, I made a list on my Instagram. Go there. There are really only 10 things you can do. So I wrote them all down in a, in a thing that you can just screenshot. Make that your background on your phone. Just do those 10 things all day. And you, if you can't sell things after doing those 10 things, you need to pick a new side hustle. Um, yeah, thanks, Jack. Sell through rate is the number of items you sold that month divided by your total inventory. If you have 100 items listed and you sell 25, you have a 25% sell through rate that for that month. Um, what is my sell through rate for eBay? Connor is asking. It depends on the category. If I'm selling something super hot, I want the it to be very fast. If I'm selling something super slow, then it doesn't matter. And if I can't replace the item, then I'll wait for the full money. Like I waited for a year to sell the, the Apple shoes for 2,500, which I think is, is low, but um, I declined like hundreds of $1,500 offers. And it's really frustrating because the first time I listed them on auction, they went up to 13 grand. And like every single one of those bids was fraudulent after 1,500. It was like magazines. It was like influencers bidding on them and none of them paid. 
So it was like very frustrating because you need to do that correctly. If you if you capitalize on the hype right the first time, it'll work. The second and third time, it didn't go that high. So I kind of killed the buzz by not actually selling them the first time. Ali is trying to list a certain amount per day. Um, I'm I my my favorite um, reselling book is the E Myth Revisited, and he should rename it to the Entrepreneur Myth Revisited. And you guys should just Google him after you're done watching this video. Go on to YouTube and watch Michael Gerber, and he will make you kind of angry. But it's important that that he makes you angry. He will tell you that you don't have a business and no one will buy whatever it is that you're building right now and it's garbage because it's not replicatable and it relies on you. If you don't come to work tomorrow, your resale business doesn't make any money. So it's not a resale business. It's just a glorified job where you are the boss and you shouldn't be the boss. And how to actually fix it is in the E-Myth Revisited. Basically, removing all the complication out of your business, making it very simple. And it's not like a robot thing. People are always like, oh, I don't want to be robotic. I love the reselling part. The thing is, if you love the reselling part, you should just be a buyer for somebody. There's two ladies working for me right now that are buyers. They love reselling, but they don't want a reselling business. They just go to the thrift store now. They, they have um, changed it into seven and a half hours. Um, they do seven and a half hours twice a week. So 15 total hours, two full days. They're both students. And they go into the sold sections. They verify solds are a certain amount. They spend a certain amount. So they get a certain commission per item. They're listing the items for me and then mailing them to me. And they're getting what they want, which is the reselling part. But they don't have to put, they're using my money. So they don't have to use any of their own money. And they're getting paid 21 to $27 an hour. So it's for them, this is perfect. They don't want to run a, a, um, a resale company. In fact, one lady had 400 items in her Poshmark closet and I bought the entire closet. She was so happy. She's like, you can just buy it for whatever I paid for it. And I don't, wa I don't want to run a Poshmark closet. I just want to do shopping and get paid. So for her, like kudos to her for actually recognizing that and not just struggling because with only 400 items in your store, you're not selling that much. You know, I don't think she, she would be making 21 to $27 in her business with that, with that small of a closet, especially since she's only on Poshmark. That's, that's, that's too, 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 not enough traffic in my opinion. Um, Shane is saying there are two different ways, or there are different ways to sell on Poshmark. Some people do, um, Oh, some people are rabid followers. I, I agree with that. Um, so meaning, let's say you consistently list a certain type of item. People will just keep coming to your closet and buying from you over and over again. I agree with that, especially people who only buy their size. Um, there was a girl that was on my channel about half a year ago, um, and her sell-through rate was one week with clothing. So she didn't use Poshmark because... Um, she didn't want to pay a 20% fee. She's like, why would I pay Poshmark a 20% fee when I could just spend that on ads? So she had an Instagram and she used ads to follow her. She's like, hey, I'm giving away a Louis Vuitton bag. Like my channel or like my page and tag your friends. I list this kind of clothing and only clothing that I wear. Okay, so it's always the same size. So don't follow this Instagram Um this, what is it called? Don't follow this Instagram feed if you are not my size because you'll never find anything that matches you. And she sold 100% of her items every single week with only like 1,600 followers. But every single follower is the exact customer that she's looking for and she's posting it and they're just buying it straight away. Most of her stuff is sold as soon as she posts it. It's awesome. So instead of using that 20% for Poshmark fees, she's just spending it directly that girl was in high school, had a hundred percent sell through rate and, um, doesn't use social media other than to sell, sell stuff. She doesn't use it to be social. I feel like there's a lot of future generation people like her. She's like, I'm not into like fake friends. I'm more into making money. So I just have my Instagram store. I keep all the money and then I hang out with my friends in real life. I'm meeting like a lot more people like that instead of 
online the relationships are a little bit more shallow right because you don't you know you can't know that many people um let's see here thank you very much ali for um helping me moderate and everyone subscribe to tap peddler that's awesome i'm happy to shout out anybody's channel um let's see here so liz is saying high price items sell well on poshmark I mean, I sold the Apple shoes on Poshmark for twenty five hundred. I've I sold tons of Gucci on Poshmark. I love it because over five hundred dollars they authenticate, right? So that makes it nice. You don't have to worry about the authentication process like on eBay. With Poshmark, once you send it in an authentic item over five hundred dollars, they take care of it for you. I'm not sure if they handle the return or not. Does anybody know that? I've never had an item over five hundred dollars returned on Poshmark. So I don't know if it's blocked. Like if they verify it and send it to the customer, that's it. There's no returns. I don't know. Um, Connor is saying, in my opinion, is 10% sell-through rate low for used shoes or decent? It depends on which shoe. And I'm always going to give you the same answer because I don't know. If, if you're selling used champion shoes, I would consider 1% sell-through rate amazing. Okay, if you're selling used Gucci and... It's those furry slippers that everybody wants. If your sell through rate's not 100%, then you're doing something wrong because there's like 800 sold and 30 for sale, right? So if you can't sell those as soon as you post them, you should maybe rethink your reselling career. It depends on which item that you're listing. Ooh, Liz has a an interesting analogy. I don't know if I 100% agree with this, but she says that sharing is the ace Listing is the king, offers are the queen, community shares are the jack, and following people are the ten. I I would say it depends on what you're what you're trying to build. If you're just reselling as a job, then I would say yes, that is a hundred percent true. If I was saying as reselling as a business, like as a business owner, I would not have any of those in the top five. I would have like managing how much money you have, um, having your business of like opening up wholesale so suppliers can just send you stuff so you can stop looking for things, um, a standard operating procedure so people can do it for you, um, and then stuff that's more boring, but then you don't have to be there every day, right? It depends on what you're looking for. If you want to resell and quit your nine to five, Michael Gerber calls this the entrepreneur seizure, okay? Meaning... You, um, you're like, oh, I hate my job. I hate my boss. I hate working for somebody else. I'm going to do it my own. I flipped, um, you know, my jacket last year for triple what I paid for it. I can run a reselling business. So then they, they go do it. And, um, the thing is that's not reselling is just an occupation, right? Running a resale store is different. There's a lot of different things that go along with that. Um, that's why I haven't had any issue keeping people working for me. People are like, oh, they can just do it themselves. Not really. Like it, 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 there's a lot of resources required to run a resale business. It's not as, it's not just finding stuff to flip. There's an inventory system. There's managing money. There's like taking photos. There's creating the habits that actually help you do it. Like what time are you listing? What? So this is great. Liz's thing is fantastic, which is when are you sharing, selling, listing, making offers, offers of likers or offers of the watchers, community shares, following. When do you do those things? Just because you know how doesn't mean that you do those things, right? Most of the Poshmark sellers I know that do the most capital are not even on social media. You know, when I went to Poshfest, um, I got to meet a lot of these awesome, uh, I consider them more business owners with, with no social media, like $200,000 in sales in Poshmark no Instagram, none. They don't even have one, right? They don't do, they do zero community shares. So it doesn't mean that that's what you should do. It's just not required. You don't have to do social media to, to do it. Um, let's see here. Let's see. You're just saying for the actual functions of the app. Yeah, I agree. The, the, the app is, uh, the app is as far as the app, sh I, ha I have a really hard time putting sharing first. I'll put sharing second. I agree with you, except for I think that listing quality items 
is more important than sharing. Um, because a quality item doesn't need to be shared at all. I listed some, if you list those Sorel boots that have the furry top, I think they're called Joan of Arc. You could list that pair of boots for 10 or 20% below market and not share it at all. And it will probably still sell with no sharing, right? But you could list a Marona um, pair of slacks. That's, you know, I don't even know if they make Marona anymore and share it a thousand times and still not sell it because right? nobody wants it. So I don't know. Um, Michelle is saying Poshmark is a terrible platform. It's set up for closet cleaners and um, it is set up for consumer sellers, but so is eBay. eBay is set up for consumer sellers. Um, Amazon is more of a, a business seller platform if you call it that way. I, I, I do think that Poshmark is set up uh, for for um, consumer sellers. That's okay though, because in my opinion, if you are a legitimate business seller, it's easy to tell. If you like, if you were to look at, let's say like Empty Hanger, if you look at her store, Jenna, her closet looks very professional. It's like, I mean, I'm not putting down the other people on Poshmark, but it's like thousands of times better than the, cl than the normal closet cleaner. Like she can charge more. She can, um, she can, a lot of things that are easier for her because her, her store, her closet is so much better than everybody else's. Right. So I think it's, it's nice versus on eBay it can be kind of cutthroat. So for what it's worth. Um, I like, or Joe Rogan actually has a, um, folder on his phone on the third page called addict. And he puts Facebook, Twitter, Instagram in that folder. So he has to scroll twice to get to the social media and then click on the addict folder to, to like get his buzz from going on social media. It's totally not necessary. Like I was actually considering taking an entire year off of social media because it doesn't matter. It's like, it literally doesn't matter. I know plenty of people who make more money than they can spend and they're not on social media at all. And I always say this, I used to work for Lexus before I did this. And, um, the average person that bought a Lexus, their Facebook account only had 30 friends. Okay. And they had an average net worth of 900 grand and they were buying a $40,000 car. So way below their means, they can, you can buy whatever car they want, but they're buying a $40,000 car, right? Usually they pay cash unless they have investing strategies that are better. Right. So conservative people, people who are buying BMWs and, and um, Mercedes are, are different type of clientele. But Lexus is more conservative. A person that buys an ES350, I don't know if you guys know what kind of car that is. It's basically a fancy Toyota Camry. Nobody that is trying to show off buys that car. It's just like a safer Camry. Right. So what does that tell you about people who are really wealthy? 30 friends on social media, no Instagram, usually just Facebook. Those 30 friends are usually family members or people that they know. 900K net worth, right? Um, versus if we get like a used car that comes in that's like a 100,000 mile Toyota Corolla, people will roll up with a crew of like 20 people to buy a car. It's like, I brought every single one of my friends that was in the neighborhood today. We're going to, you know, go to In-N-Out Burger and, and uh, you know, do you guys take financing on a $2,000 car? How much can I put on my credit card? That's like the demographic. So people with thousands of friends, it's just, it's interesting, right? So I don't know for what it's worth. Um, working there for four years sort of exposed to me. Like, okay, here's something that's really fun. I thought it was a joke when I had all these books on my desk, like self-improvement books. And this, this person was like, Chris, it's really, really easy to get rich. You can retire in less than 10 years. Here's the formula. You ready? It's pretty straightforward. All you have to do is you save 70% of your income and invest it and you live on the 30% of your income. And over the course of 10 years, if you want to continue living on that 30% income, you can without spending any more money. You've officially retired after about 10 years. It's not too difficult. I thought he was joking because I didn't know people that saved 70% of their income. I thought that was a joke because the average saving rate in America is like 1%. So I didn't know that people existed that saved 70% of their income. I literally didn't know that was a real thing, right? 
but I live in Silicon Valley. There's a lot of fire people. You guys know I hung out with Beat the Bush uh, a couple of times. Very cool guy named Francis. And his channel, subscribe, Beat the Bush, it's personal finance. He like retired in his early, th I, w I don't know how old he is, but he seems like he's in his 30s. He doesn't have to work anymore. I didn't know that was an option. I wish that when I was 18, they could have said, Chris, all you have to do is save 70% of your income, live on 30% of your income, and when you're 28, you don't have to work anymore. I didn't get that memo when I was in high school, so I had to wait a decade to figure that out in my 20s. But if, if someone had just, that's why I think the habits and things I'm talking about are so important. Um, Cheryl, is it Cheryl Ross? Hope I'm pronouncing that right. Is saying that listing desirable items are, are, I'm sorry, listing desirable items using great SEO practices is key on Poshmark. I would agree with that. I get a lot of guest buyers on eBay too. You can tell because they have a scrambled username, right? Or they have no items listed and no followers on Poshmark. If it's a guest checkout, you can, you can take a look and see all those people that, you know, just logging on for one time. Balta is saying, Chris, what are a few shoe brands to stay away from? The shoe brands you should stay away from are the ones that don't sell quickly, like Champion, right? You guys can look in my store. I have a pair that's $12 free shipping. I think it has like two views. No one cares, okay? Perfect pictures, perfect SEO, but the Champion's not known for making shoes, and those shoes are really ugly. Um, so Jeremy is saying Levi's 569 have 5,251 listed and 4289 sold. That's awesome. I bet you could even narrow that down to size. I bet like size 34, 36, 38 sell really fast. Actually, I bet 34 is the highest. So for, for in men, in men's sizes, the more expensive jeans tend to be about 34. Um, that's, that just is what it is. Baron said, what percentage of Lexus buyers had their own business? I would say less than 5%. Almost everyone in the Bay Area that's a millionaire is not a business owner. I think that's total garbage advice. If they are business owners, they're older. They're not younger. They're 50 years old, and they started a business in what they did for their career their whole life. It's just that like Mark Zuckerberg... Um, and Gary V tell everybody that they can really start their own business from scratch, but not from the successful business owners that I know, like the people who can go on a vacation or they have have staff so they can actually take time off. Those people are usually in their fifties. They're not usually that young. So thank you. Um, Tommy saying the average savings rate is 8% in 2018. That's higher than I thought, but 8%, imagine 70% is what that guy told me. And I didn't, I didn't know. Now I look at my savings rate and I'm like, this is totally different. I'm not stressed out anymore about money. I was when I was spending 99% of my money. Um, I had insane lifestyle inflation. As soon as I started making money, it was totally different. So Danny just said, who can afford to live off 30% of their income? Anyone can. I didn't know that either. I thought you have to earn a ton of money. Now, here's the thing. Okay. I will give it a caveat. If you want to be like Francis or a lot of these fire people, fire is um, financially independent, retire early. Usually fire people have an income of 150,000 or more. So living on 30% is only, is living on 45 grand, right? In the Bay area, that's considered poverty. But what they're doing is they're renting a room or they're renting. Usually people who do this are, they rent, they don't own. So they focus on making as much money as possible and saving as much as they can. So they're not usually property owners, or if they are, they don't run like a bunch of real, um, bunch of real estate investments. Some do, but like a lot of them just have a really, really high income. So that goes back into the advice I didn't get when I was a kid, which was just get into the top 20% of your field and you'll probably earn 150,000. And that's really, that's really all of the, that's really all there is to it. Get in the top 20% of your profession, you'll make 150, live on 30% of that, which is 45 grand, which is not like, that means you probably drive a used car if you have a family, right? 45 grand is not that much um, for a family of four, family of two. So it's totally doable. You can't retire early if you make 40 grand only. That doesn't really work. 
then you're spending, you know, maybe 30% of your money just on rent if you're not making that much. Um, yeah, Tom, that's a great point. It's not just brand specific. It's model specific for any kind of, any kind of product. Um, so Connor, Connor, I'm curious what your experience is with reselling because every single one of your questions is irrelevant. You're focusing totally on the wrong things. Like you're asking questions that you're looking for a quick, easy way to make money. And that's not how this works. This is more of a lifestyle. You're basically saying, how, how often should I go buy stuff? What should I buy? Does it sell? How, how fast does it sell? You have to figure that out on your own. Every single product is different. Like these are really, really, really lazy questions. If you said something like, hey, I'm interested in building a business that revolves around suits. How many suits would be a good inventory to run to get X amount to sell if I'm only selling pinstripe suits in size 44? And I also have a history of working in a retail store for, for five years in the same industry. That's like really specific. But then that person has a really high likelihood of succeeding. My friend Matt has a 2000 suit store right? And 2000 suits listed perfectly. Best pictures I've ever seen. Okay. 2000 suits on a bad month. He'll only sell a hundred items. Okay. He has 2000 items in a store That's three sales a day. He still can make six figures because he averages $80 profit on one suit. Okay. So on a horrible month, he'll sell a hundred out of 2000, still make 8,000. Right. And on a great month, he'll sell 200. But how many people in this chat would have the patience to list 2000 suits perfectly over the course of three to five years, which is how long it took him to build that store out. Right. Very almost z it rounds the zero people in this chat would do that because they're looking for fun, quick items. You go to the thrift store and find something and try to flip it. And that's, you know, going to result in making $200 a month instead of 8,000. Yep. Appreciate it. If you guys smash the like button, only 53 likes with 142 watching. Um, Pat the Resar, what's going on? Ooh, Chanel's trying the, the 10 day challenge. Awesome. If you guys want to know what the 10 things are, I'm going to go over them really quick because it's really important. Um, let's see. They are list an item every day, improve an item every day, delist an item, sell similar every day, donate one item a day or clear your workspace every day, read one page of a book or listen to one chapter. I recommend the E-Myth Revisited. It's in my reseller supplies link below. Click on that and buy that book right now and listen to it. It's going to make you really angry for the first 80% of the ebook. And then listen to the middle part where it talks about how to build a small business over and over and over again until you do. It's a really, really, really good book. And you can go to the library and get it for free too. And Michael Gerber is awesome. Google Michael Gerber, the author, and listen to him talk to Google and all these crazy Fortune 500 companies about how amazing the system is because it's legit. And he's 80-something years old. So he knows, his, he knows his jam. Also, I love Tim Ferriss's advice. Try not to read new books that come out. Do not value new information over good information. If a book just came out, it's probably not good. You want a book that has lasted for a long time and has sold really well for decades. That's the E-Myth Revisited. It's one of the best business books ever. And it's like, it was written before the internet, right? Just like how to win friends and influence people is like, it's like older than our grandparents, but it's still relevant today. Okay. Number six is visit a thrift store or contact a new supplier. Number seven, do one healthy act, drink some tea, go for a short walk, Stretch, take 10 deep breaths. Everybody take a deep breath right now. Um, eat one healthy thing. Cook one healthy meal. Um, sleep a little bit earlier. See, I like to focus on what I can do. People are like, oh, I can't do that kind of diet. I, I, whatever. Why don't you just focus on what you can do? There is for sure one healthy food you could eat. Just focus on that. Um, number eight, journal one process improvement. And the process improvements are product market research, photography, prepping, shipping, marketing, customer service, your aged inventory process, which is what this video was about, cross-listing process, suppliers and sourcing, bookkeeping and accounting, taxes. 
Um, number nine is planning tomorrow today. This that's my favorite one. So before you go to bed, plan the next day. Then when you go to sleep, you honestly sleep a lot better because you won't be as at least for me. I get really anxious if I don't know what I'm gonna do the next day. And the last one is get rid of one distraction, delete one app, um, get rid of one sucky person. Just get rid of it. It's because this channel is about less but better. Daily refinement is less but better. So like it, subscribe, smash the notification bell if you are on that same wavelength as me. See, Baron says, suits, oy vey. Who in their right mind wants to list 2,000 suits perfectly? It's, it's amazing. This, the name of his store is One Luxotic Thread. I'll put it in the chat. If you guys want to look at what an incredible store looks like, um, Luxotic Thread. It costs $6 to list one item. That's how like in depth the listings are. Um, Austin said, "How many items were in my store when I decided to list only fifty dollars and higher? A hundred. So my new store I had a hundred items in it, and then I decided to only list good stuff in it. And um, I'm I probably I'm I'm gonna myself personally not change anything that I'm doing, but I am gonna open it up to clothing." And so far, my experience selling women's clothing is exactly what I thought it is, which is it sells really slow, but really high profit. So I could panic. Like I, if I were to follow Instagram and follow the Poshmark sellers, what happens is, well, from my observation, they panic and discount their items all the time on all different platforms all randomly. And sometimes they sell and they think that it works. So then they tell everyone and everyone's doing all this random stuff. But I, I don't want to. I don't want to do that. It sounds like a. Um, I don't want to live that life of running around like my head is chopped off. I want to do. Um, I'm just gonna wait for all the money, so I'm okay with that. And the margins are are much higher than men's, so I'm just gonna wait. And so far, I've sold two dresses, one two for eighty five dollars, one um, blouse for forty five dollars. That blows my mind that there are blouses that sell for $45. That's like, it's like three ounces of clothing. I don't know how it can sell for that much. Um, let's see. Tom says, you have no illusions that part of your resale habits are based around lottery items. Yeah, see, um, I feel like I don't like gambling because I want to win. Right, that's why for me, I have no desire to go to the casino. I, I I like gambling with Wade's Ventures because it's fun, but I don't have any desire to gamble because I don't want to lose. The chances of you losing are more than fifty percent when you bet at the casino. So I don't I don't want to play when it's a fifty percent chance of losing. I want to play when there's like a two percent chance of losing. Right, I want to buy your iPhone for twelve dollars when it has an eight hundred dollar average sale price in one day. Right, that's what I'm looking for. So. But I, I can see people who like the hunt and they are looking for that crazy home run. And again, I don't know if Colin is still in here. On those items, you can wait for a while. Um, Gabe is asking if I thought about starting a book club. I could, I could do that. Um, let's see. But like right now, I'll tell you guys what books I'm reading, which is awesome. I like this Time Power. I hope you guys can see this by Brian Tracy. This has been a good read so far. Um, reading some kettle book, kettle book train, kettle book, kettle bell training. Um, I'm enjoying Tools of Titans. This is Tim Ferriss's book, one of his four books. Marie Kondo's book, the um, life changing magic of tidying up, and these little slips are from the library, so I can check out fifty books at a time. This one is Blue Ocean Shift. It's a good one. Um. E Myth Enterprise, another good one. Same guy, Michael Gerber. Um, so this one, <laughs> running a food truck for dummies. The reason why I picked up this book is because it has really good instructions. So I'm just using those same instructions, but for reselling. Um, it, it, it was it's a really good book. I have no interest in starting a food truck, but I really like how this author laid out how to how to do it. Um, and then. The Effective Executive, kind of boring, but I'm enjoying it. So those are some of the books I'm reading right now. Also this book, Getting the Love You Want, pretty decent. 
Um, I am more proud of my relationship habits than anything that I do. Like I'm obsessed with trying to make my relationships better. So just like making sure when I spend time with people, I'm as present as possible. I try to be as thoughtful as possible. Not like, and I love it because I live in Silicon Valley with the most distracted people ever. When you go out to dinner, you just watch two people who don't give a shit about each other. Excuse my language, but they're having dinner. They don't care at all. They're in two different worlds having dinner. I, I don't want that. So I love books that talk about relationships. Okay. Justin says, Chris, I'm a part-time reseller on eBay. You're working on improving your store. You focus on men's button down shirts and polos. Okay, great. Thank you. This is a great question. I have probably 50 button down shirts and polos that are pretty decent that maybe I can send to you too. So you, could, you should send me an email at chris at dailyrefinement.com. What I would focus on is um, building a large enough inventory that you could make a hundred bucks a day. That's my opinion on this. I think it's around 500 to 600 of this type of item. You can make about a hundred bucks a day, meaning you'd have 250 ish dollars in sales with um, let's say $50,000 worth of this stuff listed. And it's just a slow, steady burn. If you were to go to Terapeak and look up men's button down shirts, you wouldn't sell men's button down shirts because there's not a lot of demand. It's like um, 20 to 50,000 searches per month versus like 20 million Nintendo searches per month, right? So if you want to sell in this category, you need to have a larger inventory, in my opinion, and try to do some lots. Lots did well for me when I was trying to do that. That's that's where I started. When I first started, I watched Rake and Profit and I was like, holy crap, I didn't know thrifting existed. So I went and bought all this stuff um, at, at Goodwill Bulk and it was okay, but it doesn't sell as fast as, as other categories. So, But if you're in this, what I would do is just focus on building a, a large enough inventory. You don't have to do anything fancy. Dress shirts are dress shirts. For me as a guy, I, I do care about the measurements. I care about the pattern. I don't need a mannequin. Um, so whatever makes it easy for your process. Yeah, Blue Ocean Strategies is, is an interesting book. It basically just, just try to pick markets that are not saturated. Um, all right, Allie, have a great night. Thank you for stopping by and admitting. Um, let your friend know if they want to do a collaboration. Kevin Ryan says men's clothes in general are terrible. Not my favorite. Um, I'm not really listing any men's clothing right now unless it's for fun. Sometimes I like selling, um, clothing or whatever items I find for fun. So it depends. Um, William is saying another great question from, from, uh, from William. You have a friend with a very large inventory of games. You spend four to five hours scanning them looking for ones that have 80% sell through rate or higher. It depends on your goal. So earlier in the, in the call, I said, you need to pick what your ideal product is. For me, very few video games are $20 profit unless I have to go hunting for them. And if I go hunting for them, then my time, I have to use my time and then I have to, you know, it's difficult it would be worth it for me to like bid on a video game lot maybe if I was going to go that route. But um, for me, that's not an ideal item. But if you have, um, if you have um, one of those, those things that cleans discs and you have a process, sometimes video games are ins insanely lucrative. Books, media, video games, movies, they sell really well when you have the right systems in place. What's up, Cindy? Thank you for stopping by. Um, let's see. Duncan says, guide for couples. Give your wife everything she wants. Well, I think it's important to to always communicate. My, my wife is n like a no BS lady, so she would rather... Okay, this is her opinion, and I think this, is, this has worked out really well for me. The problem is the problem, and we are the team. That's how she looks at it. She's like, whatever you're working on at work, if there's a problem, it has nothing to do with you. So just present the problem when you get home, and then together we will fix it. 
Or if I have a problem at work, I'll go home, present the problem. The problem is the problem. It has nothing to do with me. If I come home I'm in, and I, I kind of learned this from Tim Ferriss, he's like, they're trying to practice the way they communicate with each other with his girlfriend. So if his girlfriend says, um, um, the way that you're speaking to me makes me feel like this is what you're trying to say, something like that. So that, so that you can kind of communicate and get an idea of what the other person is feeling. Because it's not really what you say, it's how they feel about what you say. So it's good to just work on it that way. So Luciano said that I made him feel, or it could be him, he or she, feel like 400 items is a joke. It depends on what you're selling. It's not a joke. It Actually, this is really important because it does not matter what my opinion is. Just compare yourself today to who you were yesterday, right? It, it depends on what you're working on. If you want to feel like crap, the person that lists the most items a day is 9,000 per day. Okay? The the person who lists the most items online lists 9,000 a day. In comparison to that person, we are all doo-doo. Okay? That's real. Like, how many are you listing a day? 20? This person is listing 9,000. They list more per day than you do all year. And they do it all year long. Right? You take days off, they don't they have a company right they have 150 people listing for them and they maybe earn more money per day than you do all year also but you know to each their own don't just compare yourself with who you were yesterday that's really helped me out too i don't have to be per i don't have to be perfect i don't have to pretend like i know what i'm doing all i have to do is be better than i was yesterday that's all i can do how can you really even trying to compare yourself to others is ridiculous especially when you live here like this is one of the like, like the things, the odd things about living here is that there's so many absurdly successful people that I don't compare myself to others. The, 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 the average person here is a millionaire, right? So I'm not a millionaire, so I'm below average just by default looking around when I see, meet somebody. But I'm not going to spend all day being depressed. No one's going to really feel bad for me. I'm choosing to live here, right? So... Just got to up your game. I like surrounding myself with people who are really good. Now, I'm going to end this call on just one thought, which is I'm I'm at the point now where anytime I try to improve anything in my business, it's really hard. And it's the same with my workout. It's the same with my diet. I'm at that like range where it starts to get really, really, really hard. Okay, because it's like pushing my limit, my own personal limits. So if you guys have any experience with that, Maybe let me know. Let me know in the comment section below or email me what you've done to sort of get over this hump of once you're starting to plateau. But I'm feeling like I am at that stage right now and I don't want that to happen. I want to continuously push. But I get it. Once you get to a certain point, my day is already pretty optimal for... Um, it's optimal for my current goals. I could obviously have b bigger and better goals, but I just, you know, it's really hard. Trying to get, get the day started trying to be better than yesterday is insanely hard. Okay. That's why instead of telling people, don't go on Instagram, don't do this. I made a list of what you should do. And that list will take you all day. It's super hard. Okay. So anyway, guys, hopefully this is useful and inspirational and motivating for you guys and not a bummer. Um, but let me know via email if you uh, left a review on on iTunes for my podcast. I'm happy to send you my 10-day challenge. Do that 10-day challenge every day for 10 days and your store should be totally different. Um, it's on my Instagram for free. And also I recommend that if it works, don't stop doing it after 10 days. So I appreciate you guys. Until next time, make progress daily.